So I'm delighted to be here today. Um, Betsy Rice Distinguished Lecture Series. That seems so much more important than me and anything that I could have to say. But I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be part of this program today. Also, Kathleen had mentioned the program last night at the MacArthur. And also, um, Arkansas Women's History Institute also invited me to give the keynote speech at the Arkansas Museum Association also yesterday morning. So my voice is a little bit scratchy, I'll apologize, but I have my water. <clears throat> so I'm hoping that I can give you a good overview of some of the research that I've been working on for this book. Um, I will tell you honestly, never occurred to me in my entire life to write a book. And it's not writing itself, so I can tell you it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why I started, but I am really excited to be done with it. So as Kathleen <laughs> said, it should be wrapped up and it should be out this fall. So it's primarily a practitioner's guide because I do not consider myself a scholar. I am a museum practitioner, which means I work in public history and I want to know what the public thinks about the history. And then I want to be able to adjust what I think about it and tell stories that are more representational of the community. So as a practitioner, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about this research that I have found and why I think it's important. So I will get started. As we look ahead to the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in August of 2020, we have the opportunity to begin an active dialogue around the interpretation of suffrage. This is, of course, easier said than done. And yet, on the eve of the centennial, it is time for us to begin. However, before we dive into getting an, a focus, before we focus on updating the storyline, there are a few questions for us to ask. Firstly, does our typical storyline, which spans from 1848 to 1920, adequately reflect both the breadth and current societal understandings of both the complications and the nuances of the suffrage movement? Does it leave enough room for a robust conversation around the racial, economic, religious, and political tensions within the American movement to enfranchise all women? If our answers to those questions are no, then perhaps now is the time to reflect and adjust on our understanding of just what exactly we will be celebrating next year. The last national celebration took place in 1995 and marked the 75th anniversary of suffrage. And while it seems to be a gross oversimplification, I'll go ahead and say it, much has changed in the field of women's history in the last 25 years. <laughs> the explosion of materials and information available online, this was not possible in 1995. Social media, love it or hate it, it gives you an opportunity to have conversations and reactions in real time. Instantaneous feedback that is provided in these ways, not only how important that is to the discussion, but also the profound increase in scholarship that focuses on the intersectionality of women's history. Again, in 1995, this was, we were not necessarily talking about this. But before we dig deeper into this topic, I'd like to share a quick personal story with you. Um, a reflection that comes from my nine-year tenure when I was the executive director of the Sewell Belmont House and Museum in Washington, D.C. And it really was the starting place for the book that I'm working on. So let me read you an excerpt. She was a racist, you know, Alice. My initial meeting with Dr. Alita Black noted scholar on Eleanor Roosevelt and longtime stakeholder of the Sewell Belmont House had started off poorly. It was September of 2008, and I'd been executive director for less than a month. At that time, my familiarity with the National Women's Party and its founder, Alice Paul, was just that. It was a broad strokes familiarity. My academic training in progressive era history, of course, taught me the overarching story, and I assumed somewhat correctly that Alita 
was thinking about, when she made her comments, that she was thinking about the racially segregated women's suffrage procession that took place in March of 1913 on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Even so, I had not yet, having only been there a month, I had not yet delved into the archive, the long list of resources that Jennifer Krapchuk, the brilliant um, collection manager of NWP, had provided for me. Had I already done that, then I would have understood that Black's comment went actually deeper than just the controversial marching formation of a single suffrage procession. It went much deeper. <coughs> In all honesty, I had not yet formulated an opinion yet of where the NWP's actions fell on the spectrum of racism. However, I don't remember being overly concerned given their place within the contextual time frame, and I am certain that I did not consider Alice Paul to be a racist. That said, I did look forward to delving into the research in the archive so that I could gain a better understanding of the nuances of the racial tensions of the time and to learn more about the background of the controversial Southern strategy, determining for myself if the calculated campaign tactics and strategies, <clears throat> often excused as politically expedient, rose to the level of what I personally considered to be racist or not. Despite the rough start, I'm happy to say that our meeting ended amicably and we agreed to continue our conversation in the coming days and weeks. Those conversations continued and over the next decade, I'm happy to say that Alita became a trusted friend, a donor, and a good sounding board for me as I worked through my understanding and knowledge of the National Women's Party. For those of you who are not familiar, I'll share a brief history of the National Women's Party, which was founded in the crucial final years of the suffrage movement by Alice Paul. Without a doubt, the NWP played a courageous and groundbreaking role in securing the right to vote for women. The first organization ever to picket the White House, these women borrowed their militant tactics from the suffragettes in England, which included burning President Woodrow Wilson's speeches outside of the gates of the White House, and they continued, and they continued to picket even once the United States entered into World War I. Recognizing that the vote was only the first step in a larger agenda for women's rights, Paul wrote and began light lobbying for the first version of the Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA, in 1923. Most people think that that was written in the 60s or 70s. It's not. It's 1923. And beginning in 1929, the National Women's Party, <clears throat> excuse me, National Women's Party operated its headquarters at Second at Second and Constitution Avenue on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. The House became a staging ground for the National, Woman Par National Women's Party's advocacy for women's political, social, and economic equality in the United States and really throughout the world for the next five decades. The NWP's innovative tactics and strategies are represented, <laughs> are represented in the historic collections, which document the mass political movement for women's full citizenship in the 20th century. In addition, the nation's first feminist library, named after Florence Bayard Villas, is filled with books written by women and for women. The influential political cartoons by Nina Allender, original suffrage banners, sashes, scrapbooks, and photographs, and decorative arts are all included in the collection. Now let me add that the textile collection includes about a thousand different pieces of, of cloth. Now that's not all banners, but the, uh, the banner that you saw, the Kaiser Wilson banner, that's not one of the ones that survived. Ooh, shocking, I know. Mm -hmm. But as they picketed with that, as is, was often the case, the women's banners were torn from their hands and actually ripped up and thrown mm -hmm. into the street. Mm -hmm. So it's a miracle, I think, that there are any banners. But the Kaiser Wilson banner, <laughs> for, for example, I think there's a, there's a piece that's about five inches in diameter, and the American, uh, uh, the Smithsonian American History Museum has that scrap, and they believe that it is what's left of the Kaiser Banner. Anyway. The NWP's, oh sorry, um, 
In the last in the last eleven years since that meeting with Alita, much has changed in the field of women's history and in my personal understanding of the National Women's Party and Alice Paul. I still believe without a doubt that the National Women's Party was a critical organization during both the final seven-year push for the 19th Amendment and later with the introduction to the Equal Rights Amendment. However, the tactics, while successful, were always polarizing, even within the movement. And as history has shown, the organization was ultimately flawed both in their leadership, both in their leadership and its narrow mission statement that continued to push aside women of color. Recent works by noted scholars such as Dr. Lisa Tetralt and Dr. Sally Roche Wagner, among many others, offer a deeper look into the suffrage movement and the ramifications of the sheer unevenness of voting rights throughout our nation's history. Collectively, their work also proves that the venerated stories that we believe to be inscrutable need a careful and fresh look through a 21st, through a 21st century lens. In Roche Wagner's anthology, The Women's Suffrage Movement, she reminds us that Matilda Jocelyn Gage wrote in The History of Women's Suffrage, and I'm quoting, under the old Providence Charter, women had full suffrage in Massachusetts from 1691 to 1780. With the adoption of the Constitution in 1780, their voting rights were limited, but women still voted for all elective offices except governor, council, and legislator for five more years, end quote. We should also not forget that indigenous women had political authority and equality long before Columbus arrived. Matilda Jocelyn Gage and Elizabeth Cady Stanton knew this, having been made aware of the female lineage society common to indigenous communities within their home state of New York and beyond. So the victory of 1920 was more about women regaining voting rights and not necessarily achieving them for the first time. Dr. Lisa Tetralt in The Myth of Seneca Falls re-examines what she calls the creation of the story of the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, writing that while the Women's Rights Convention was a unique and pivotal event, and more than likely the first public meeting to demand women's enfranchisement, it was not the beginning of the larger movement for universal women's rights as it is <clears throat> routinely referred. The late doc Dr. Rosalind Turbord Penn's unparalleled work, African American Women and the Struggle for the Vote, still reminds us that many, many African American women worked diligently for the suffrage cause, and while working on anti-lynching campaigns, access to education, and for the safety of their families. The 19th Amendment lifted the gender restrictions on votings, and it actually allowed African American women to vote alongside white women before it was largely undermined by the rollout of voter suppression and Jim Crow laws at the state level. Women of indigenous nations, Chinese immigrants, and Hispanic women all had to wait many, many more decades before they were enfranchised and allowed to vote. So as museum and library practitioners and donors and board members that support museums and libraries, how do we begin to have an honest conversation to mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment? One, a conversation that moves forward to re-examine the story and refuses to simply replay the same tune over and over again. Now to some, any alteration to the well-trodden story of suffrage, which focuses almost exclusively on the efforts of white women, may signal an unwelcome change to a cherished and venerated story, and as such, may cause even a personal upwelling of disappointment or even anger suggesting that issues of race, politics, economic factors, gender and religious bias are included in the discussion is seen by some as an effort to lessen the importance of the work of the white suffragists. If we point out personal flaws, misdeeds, and shortcomings of suffragists, and, or when we offer a critical examination of the areas 
where their words or actions fell short of our contemporary expectations, <laughs> some believe that this ultimately reduces the inherent value of their heroism and tremendous personal sacrifice. Over the last 18 months, as I've been working on this book, I've spoken at conferences, I've talked to friends and family, and many, many trusted colleagues. And I've been routinely asked, why do we need to talk about these issues? Are we just trying to find fault? Are we trying to present a narrative that is more politically correct? Um, why, after all, should we confront these issues when we really just want to celebrate the centennial of suffrage? and the women who work for the cause. I had one dear friend who said, Paige, you're ruining the centennial for me. And I said, I'm really not trying to do that, I promise. <laughs> but I always answer that first, the critical work by brilliant scholars such as Rosalind Turborg Penn, they have expanded the dialogue and identified the many, many, many women of color whose vital work on suffrage and civic engagement deserves to be amplified and uplifted alongside the select few iconic women that we all know. Second, if libraries, sites, and museums continue to tell only the safe portion of the story, then we will miss the opportunity to learn and understand more about the critical divisions that were within the women's suffrage and equality movements. If we do this, it's possible that we will be seen as out of touch and therefore irrelevant to our public audiences, which is exactly what we don't want to happen. And lastly, and, and on a very personal level, because I believe that it is possible to acknowledge the accomplishments of the white suffragists, knowing and understanding full well that they were fearless and flawed at the same time. I believe that we can hold two truths simultaneously. I do not believe it's either or. If historic sites and museums move forward to expand the interpretation of suffrage, then it will also be necessary for not only practitioners, but donors and board members to also reframe, also reframe personal expectations. Discussions and plans around the centennial are already underway at many sites, and it is very likely that some events and programs may consist, as they have in the past, of mostly white women in white dresses celebrating their right to vote without acknowledging the deeply divisive and racially oppressive tactics used in part to secure that right. In a 2018 blog post penned within the first few months of her tenure, Virginia Case, who is the president and CEO of the League of Women Voters of the United States, tackled this issue head on. The post was entitled, her post was entitled, Facing the Hard Truths About the League's Origins, and you can find that online. It was in response to a widely read New York Times op-ed piece by Brent Staples. His piece called out the racial actions and rhetoric of white suffrage White, white suffragists, including League of Women Voters founder Carrie Chapman Catt. In speaking about the past action of the League and Catt, Mrs. Case unabashedly quoted the highly controversial comment, and I'm quoting, white supremacy will be strengthened, not weakened, by women's suffrage, end quote. And Mrs. Case chose not, which I thought was brilliant, not to make excuses she stated instead that Kat was, and again I quote, a complicated character, a political operative, and by modern standards, yes, racist, end quote. On the eve of the centennial of the 19th Amendment, there are a limited number of women's history sites with direct ties to suffrage. Though there are many sites, libraries, museums, schools, and community organizations that will incorporate content around suffrage and civic engagement into their exhibits and programs for in order to recognize 2020. That said, not every organization should or of course would be willing to take such an aggressive public stance as the League. However, we as history practitioners 
and others as supporters of museums and libraries can collectively do more to demythicize the legacy of suffrage and take a closer look at the impact and ramifications of the white suffragists' actions. We can begin to unpack and reframe the overall narrative, unlearn what we think we know, and challenge ourselves to leave room in the conversation to include the voices that offer us a new and different perspective than our own. So again, easier said than done. But I would like to at this point, and I'm hoping that you all, this can be a conversation, if you all have questions. How do we start this new conversation? How do we broach that? So I'm lucky to be part of, um, I'm lucky to be part of an organization called American Association for State and Local History. I am one of the co-founders of the Women's History Affinity Group for that, for that um, museum group. A couple of years ago, we started having panel discussions and roundtable sessions at the AASLH conference every year. And we started to think about, as practitioners, how do we start this conversation? Because it's a difficult one to start. And so just last September, we had the final roundtable session in which we talked about how do we start this as practitioners? And how do we overcome the barriers to telling new stories? Because it's not, that, it's not easy. So I pulled together a slide that comes from my own research, but also the um, Women's History Affinity Group of AASLH is getting ready, in the, literally, in the next couple of weeks to um, go ahead and release what we're calling a value statement around 2020, which is a list of guiding principles and also a list of questions that you, as an individual historian, practitioner, or organization, can start to ask to think about how we can reframe this. So, let me go through this real quick. Remember always what states had suffrage before 1920 and why. Do you remember that first slide that showed the, um, the, the map of the United States? The western states, of course, had suffrage before the rest of the country. Some of them very, very early on in the 1800s. So that's a good place to start the story, not just 1848. What were the connections between the anti-slavery movement, temperance, and suffrage? Particularly interesting when you look at temperance and suffrage. I've had people say, why would anybody be anti-suffrage? Well, when you think about it and when you start to do the research, it's a fascinating reason. Some women didn't believe that they needed or wanted the right to vote. Some were privileged and um, part of um, uh, economically very viable families, and they didn't need to have the vote, they thought, because their husbands, or they themselves even, were very connected to political, political operatives in their community or their state. And so they really already had somebody to go talk to about what they wanted. They didn't need the vote. So when you think about anti-suffrage from, um, from the corporate level, Jack Daniels was very against women's suffrage because they thought that if women had the vote, they would vote for temperance. And then what would that do for Jack Daniels, right? There's always a corporate connection. So again, interesting comments that you can, and questions that you can start to look at and then figure out how you want to tell the story of suffrage as you move forward. How did citizenship impact voting rights? Until the Indian Citizens Citizenship Act of 1924, indigenous people and American Indians were not even citizens. In my home state of Arizona, women who lived on Indian reservations couldn't vote until the 1960s and sometimes the 1970s, for heaven's sake. What was the impact of poll taxes and literacy tests? If you think that those are in the past, they're not, because the impact, indeed, still impacts communities and groups today. So think a little bit about that. And also, what are the connections between the 19th Amendment and civil rights? You can draw a direct line from the 19th Amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. One of the things that I was, frankly, disappointed to learn about Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party is that once the amendment, 19th Amendment was passed, 
and then the work for equal rights became the most important priority for Alice, there were plenty of opportunities for the National Women's Party to work with and help women of color who wanted to expand civic engagement and enfranchisement. And Alice said no. Flat out, she said no. You're, you're a woman, yes, but that's a race issue, and that's not for me and my organization to work toward. Today, we do see that as a shortcoming, certainly, but you can also tell these vital stories between civil rights and the 19th Amendment. Now, most of this, I think, is going to fall to us, museum practitioners, library practitioners, etc. We're the ones who are going to do the research, and we're the ones that have the galleries to fill, the public programs to, to come up with and fill the seats. We're the ones who are going to be thinking about some of these um, questions as we move forward. So again, this is just a list of things that we can all look at. Expand and elevate the multiple perspectives and voices. Acknowledge, do not ignore, but acknowledge the race, racial divisions. Form partnerships with community groups early in the planning process. You know, I know a lot of people who say, you would really like to have a diverse audience for this program. Maybe we should reach out and invite XYZ. Well, maybe you should reach out and invite them when you're planning the program. That might be a good idea. Then it could be a code program, and not just that you're inviting because you hope for a diverse audience. Convene public focus groups and ask for advice. Easier said than done, I know, but it is critical to learn and to hear firsthand from your museum and library patrons. Broaden your, con your content around enfranchisement and voter rights. I know that voter rights sometimes gets a political stamp put on it. Well, we don't want to be too political. Well, the voter enfranchisement there is a way for you to, to share this content through a historic lens that actually doesn't have to be partisan. So again, think a little bit about creatively how you might do that. Always recognize both intersectionality and privilege. So standing here as a white museum practitioner, I always, I try my best, not always, but I do try my best to think about other voices, other voices than my own, and absolutely make sure that, again, I'm reaching out as early in the process as possible to figure out what types of events my communities may be looking for, and hopefully then I can address that. One really difficult piece of, well, women's history is always difficult. It's always difficult to find women in archives. It's, not, it's, it's always a challenge. But finding women of color can be almost impossible almost impossible. So when you're thinking about finding information, trying to find information on African-American suffragists, remember that not all of the African-American women who worked for suffrage self-identified as suffragists. Most of the time, they were just women rolling up their sleeves and doing their work. <clears throat> you're going to need to look outside of your own archive and look into church records, local community groups, Sororities have wonderful records, but again, you're going to need to do the footwork and build relationships that's going to allow you to have access to those documents, because it's probably not going to be in your archive. I certainly know it's not in the National Women's Party's archive, not at all. <coughs> Encourage new research and try your best to add new collections. In 25 years, we don't want to be here again saying that we're having trouble finding women of color in our archives. So start today. Who should you reach out to? Who in your community, who should have their, which women in your community should be invited to be sharing their personal and professional papers with your institution? Think, think, think in the future. So, as a museum practitioner, donors, board members, trustees, these are people that we rely heavily on and are so, in my, in my own case, very, very grateful for all of the support that I've had through board members and donors over the years. So this one is for you. I'm assuming some of you in the, in the 
audience might be board members or hopefully certainly your donors and patrons. Um, encourage staff to really look at new stories and to support their efforts to include diverse stories and histories. If you look at an exhibit panel, if, you are a, if, I'm, if I'm a white person and I look at an exhibit panel and everybody in it looks like me, I should be asking, there are others, there are other people that are not in this story. How can we include them? So sometimes it's nice for the donors and the patrons to also ask these questions, not just the staff. So again, acknowledge the racial divisions and the history. This is very important. Expand board membership to include more people of color. The recent statistics that are coming out about boards is really shocking. Very, very, very few boards offer any seats to people of color. Our organizations can't be diverse unless our boards are diverse and our staff is diverse. So again, think about this, how we're going to change things in the future. Think about sponsoring not just a fantastic exhibit or program, think about supporting behind the scenes. Perhaps that means board training and staff training on diversity and inclusion. There are many, many people that are working on this and doing brilliant work. There are webinars, there are books, there are people that can come in and help talk to your organization about it. Perhaps that would be a great way to, um, to expand the diversity in, the organ in organizations. Think about forming an outside advisory committee to actually guide policy. It's not just about asking internally, what do we need to do and what are the changes that we need to make? Think about having an outside advisory group to ask these questions of. And almost most importantly, try to fund research fellowships that are going to encourage new and diverse scholarship. One of the things that was most difficult for me while I was at um, National Women's Party, the Sewell Belmont House, was trying to include stories, diverse stories, of African-American suffragists, and not having the time to be able to even go right down the street to the Library of Congress and do the research. Because again, research takes a lot of time. The, the Sewell Belmont House was um, designated by President Obama as the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument in April of 2016. It's coming up on the third anniversary. It was a three-year process that was um, arguably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life for a lot of reasons, but it was also one of the most rewarding. So now the National Park Service runs the site, and I'm happy to say they have the staffing to keep it open seven days a week when I simply couldn't raise enough money to do so, but they also have the money and the grants available to provide fellowships for researchers to come in at all levels and do the research that the staff still doesn't have time to do. But they can do the research that they can then tell these stories and include these new perspectives, new to us, not new. The work was still being done. It's just new to us. That is, to me, one of the best things about this new relationship with the National Park Service. So I mentioned, um, during this talk, I mentioned several resources. Here is a real short list of books, not, not necessarily new ones, but four that I find have been very pivotal in the research that I've done. I would be happy to email these slides to anyone if you would like to, to see it. And I also have a bibliography of 75 or 85 different sources. Some are scholar articles and some are books. I'd be happy to email that also and share the information. So at this point, that, that is um, all of the information I have, but I encourage you to be in touch, and I hope that everyone has questions. I'd be willing to answer anything. Thank you all very much for being here. Question? Yes, please. Thank you very much. I wonder two things. One, since you've been here, have you had an opportunity, if you don't already know her, uh, Abrams to visit her home library on oh, Wolf Street here in London. I have not. She says go. I will. 
Tell me her name again, Annie Abrams. Annie McDaniel Abrams, and I'm sure some of the audience know her. <laughs> and I would also encourage those who not had an opportunity, if you're interested in this topic, uh, to visit those that are local to also visit the Abrams Hall Library. That would be fantastic. Thank you. And then the last thing is on your end page where mm -hmm. you listed the four references. Yep. Um, or maybe off the page, do you use any of the books from Out of the Wales? I do. Okay. I do. Um, there are several that I use. And like I said, this is just the, this is a very short list of books that I've used kind of probably more recently. There are wonderful, uh, amazing books, not only um, the ones that you've mentioned, but there are also um, books from the 19, late 60s and early 1970s. Also, that I've, I'm lucky enough, I've been able to find them. Um, they're out of print, but I've been able to find them through Amazon Books. Um, usually I go to used bookstores and I have a list of books that I'm trying to find, women's history books. And now with Amazon Books, I've actually been able to find some. So if you all have not been on that platform, you should try. Because again, these books, um, are they're absolutely pivotal. And we should be incorporating them into our research as we move forward. Thank you very much for letting me know about Annie Abrams as well. I'm going to remember that. I would like to hear you struggle with a question you can't answer. But uh, in your research and looking into this, uh, you, you said uh, 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 all was flawed mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you started, the lady said she was racist, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, so here's your question. Why? What, in your opinion, mm -hmm. is the cause? Because it seems hypocritical. They're, they're working for the same purpose and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I, you can't answer it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. So, so you're asking why I can... Well, why can someone who's working so hard mm -hmm. for women not understand that there's no difference? Yes. What in the world? And, and see, the problem is it still happens today. Oh, of course. I don't get it. Of course. It. Uh, it, it's complicated. It, it is. is. And let me. And so you can't I, well, up. I can't, but I can tell you what I can tell you where my thinking is now. Okay. And I also don't believe, and I've, I mentioned also time, also um, several times where I talked about, did I personally feel that the actions were racist? So there's a personal reconciliation when you're thinking about and writing about and researching these types of topics because they're hard to hear. It's difficult, and I know a lot of a lot of women who have said. Paige Ellis is my hero. I don't, I don't want to think of her as being anything other than perfect. But like you pointed out, how come she was working for nothing other than women's rights almost from the time that she was, I think, 22 until her death in 1977? She worked singly for women's equality. So how, how could she have not supported African-American women's rights as well? And I'm not a scholar on Alice Paul, so I won't attempt to get into her brain. But what I believe is that the race issue always seems more complicated than it actually is. And I'm not trying to gloss over that lightly. Dr. Rosalind Turbord Penn, who unfortunately and terribly too much too early passed last December, her book on the struggle for African-American women and the vote was a seminal book, and it was written in 1998. And while there have been more books written and kind of building on her research, I was lucky enough to know Dr. Turbord Penn and work with her on several occasions, um, programs at the National Women's Party and at the National Archive. And she would tell you, if she was here today, she would tell you, Alice Paul was a racist. I have absolutely no question about that. And when I would talk to her, I would say, you know, I don't see anything in her writing. I don't see anything that really pinpoints that. And, and as you would with other suffragists who had more racist statements. Um, and you know what she told me? She told me, Paige, as a black woman, I believe that if you 
a white woman of privilege. And being privileged is, in a lot of cases, just being white. She said, if you don't use everything you have, and I'm paraphrasing, everything you have, everything you know, and everything you are, to promote up and raise up other women and women of color during your lifetime and your work, then I consider you to be a racist. So that is also Alita Black's description of racism. Alita does not use that word lightly, and I've had many conversations over the last 11 years with her about this, but she will say without a doubt, nope, Alice was racist. She had a national platform, she had tens and tens of thousands of donors who supported her work, and she would not step up for African American women because it was just too complicated and it might delay the vote for white women. So again, political expedient, Southern strategy, it's complicated. And I don't, I don't urge anyone to accept my point of view on this. Um, what I do ex hope is that you will think a little bit more about it, you will question things, you will find your own answers, and then you will guide yourself as you move forward. But I hope, again, it's the beginning of the conversation. And thank you for the question. You're right, it is complicated. I yes. I don't think the answer to the question as to why her name is called and not fight for black women is because she lives in a society that says that people of color were inferior. They were not mm -hmm. worthy of the vote. Um, and so they, they did probably not deserve it. It's the same attitude that we have in America today. Yeah. I don't think it's complicated. It's just that it's the value that you place on people and how much they work. It is, and the value and the priority that you place. And the priority. Work. Work. Yes, yes, um, you're exactly right. But also, I think you're correct. First, thank you for pointing out the fact that we need to include uh, people of color on committees mm -hmm. because you, you're one of your first statements is that the people were fierce, but they were also, they had flaws. Mm -hmm. That's true, people do have flaws, but there's also history there. So, what is the history of the um, black women's movement to get the vote? It still needs to be told, even though the history is not pretty, it's still necessary that we know. Because if you exclude black people, then you exclude part of our history. That history needs to be told. I don't think you'll find many people who are surprised at those uh, racial attitudes back there. That's the way America, America saw, and yes. still think. Yes, it is. You're, exa you're exactly right. And I think one of the worst things that we can do as public historians or practitioners or donors and, and board members is to ignore the history and continue to ignore this history. We need to be talking about it. We should be talking about it. If it's difficult, well, I'm sorry. It's just going to be difficult. These are conversations that we should be having and that we can have for the betterment of our organizations and our communities. Let me tell you that... Um, you know, the, this is just a snippet of the, of the work that I've been doing for the book, and I will tell you without a doubt, um, I failed as the executive director of the Sewell Belmont House. I was there for nine years, and I was never able to tell the story of the African American women who worked for suffrage. There were members of the National Women's Party who were African American, and I was never able to get that done. Nine years. Now it's complicated. I was raising money for salaries. I was trying to keep the doors open. Same thing as anybody working for any other organization. However, in hindsight, I could have done more. If I didn't have the stories, if I didn't have the photographs, you know what I could have done? I could have left a blank space on a wall with a label that said, we know there were plenty of women whose names and photos are not on these walls, and we are going to find them and put them up. Please come back. Simple as that. It's just acknowledging that we know they were there. We don't have their pictures. We don't know their names yet. Anyway, that's just a mea culpa for myself. Any other questions? Um, I think this is really uh, a great presentation. People need to hear this. And I really like that you said that uh, the women of color doing the work, they were there the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, we are the ones that are new to learn about yes. that, right? And so, like you said, we are the ones that are going to have to adjust. We're the yes. ones that are going to, you know. It's new to us. Yes, yeah, it's, new it's to not us. new. It's not new to them. Right. 
Right, so, exactly. And if you look hard enough, you, you can find it. There's two new exhibits that are opening up um, in Washington, D.C. The first opened last night um, at the National Portrait Gallery. And um, the curator, um, Dr. Kate LeMay, has done an incredible amount of work finding um, it's the portrait gallery, so it's clearly done through art and portraits. She's found an enormous amount of information about African-American suffragists. And there's also a new exhibit that will open in May, but I don't remember the exact date, at the National Archive. And they also are delving into this. So you'll start to see this at the bigger museums, but I think even small places, we have an obligation also to do the research and to be able to tell these stories. So any last questions? Well, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure.